So, good morning. Um, my name is Sven Schade. I have a very particular view on the Green Deal. I'm not in the high political uh, quarters of the uh, Commission, but I'm working for the Research and Innovation Directorate. Uh, so, we have uh, published recently a uh, Green Deal related call for research and innovation activities. And in that context, this presentation was uh, prepared and it was appreciated by many uh, networks to give a quick introduction into the Green Deal and make a, a slight look into the uh, innovation activities and what it means for companies. Uh, that's essentially what I want to do for you today uh, to show where the Green Deal originates, what are, what are the different elements, and then look into one particular aspect of, uh, of innovation, whereas colleagues will talk more about the international, the export uh, aspects, the global markets development and the trade. That is really not my uh, domain. If we want to understand the Green Deal, uh, we have to go back to 2018-19. Um, how did the world before COVID uh, looked like. We recognized that the climate change is no longer something which is happening for the next generation, affecting the next generation. Here are some uh, symbolic uh, pictures. The River Rhine fell dry twice, two years in a row to an extent that basically the chemical industries in Germany and in France had disrupted uh, supply and, and uh, export chains. We have changes in the electricity market. You see here the middle picture, which is uh, deep red. Uh, electricity prices on a weekend in Germany fell into the negative range for the whole day. So you were paid to get to, to use electricity. At the same time, um, the, um, insects were basically in a steep decline all over Europe. And um, some people, expect uh, climate change to be addressed much faster. You see there in the, in the uh, lower row, the use demonstrating as Fridays for Future. And in France and, and elsewhere, basically the call for, yes, we need a transition. Yes, a transition is needed, but the starting point has to be the social justice. That has, was also happening in 2018, 19. We have two ways to get out of that. Uh, the one is we have a, an international agreement with a perspective on 2030, how the world should look like. These are, this is framed by the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, they these uh, 17 uh, goals, which cover the whole range of activities from poverty, nutrition, education, uh, gender equality down to the uh, environmental aspects um, and uh, peace and international cooperation. So on the political side, there is a traction behind uh, the, the global agenda 2030. And on the technological side, we also see that we have new solutions which are, which are arising everywhere. Energie in Bürgerhand, a social inclusion, energy cooperatives on the local level, building on renewable energy as an, in, as an instrument to be uh, ecologically sane and environmental uh, and socially just. If we look in with this framework, we, uh, get, uh, we went into the European Parliament elections in early 2019. What was the outcome of the election? Well, first of all, a much more diverse European Parliament. So the, uh, the majority was no longer in the center center, but the center had to extend either to the left or to the right in order to get uh, secure maj majorities. That meant the commission had to, uh, in, in its proposals, to include a much a wider range of, uh, of opinions. We also see a much faster technological development happening everywhere. everywhere. Um, and we see the, the question in the background, what will be Europe's place in a changing world order where two systems which are completely different socially, politically, the US and China, but which are also different to one another, uh, basically will govern uh, the world and are the new world, uh, world forces. The two are tied together by, by the economies, one being dependent on the other. But where will Europe's place in this changing world order be? So with, with this, 
uh, with these challenges, the, the, com uh, the new commission led by Ursula von der Leyen got into office in autumn uh, 2019. It was more than a symbol uh, that, she, that Ursula von der Leyen presented the Green Deal as her first policy priority in the second week of being in office. Um, the Green Deal is displaced not as a green, fully green agenda. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen called the uh, Green Deal our European growth strategy. So it is an economic and ecological agenda. It, it, integrates the, uh, as, it integrates eight policy areas, which are uh, sectoral policy areas, but it also integrates um, the ambitions of leaving nobody behind and transforming the EU, EU economy. Um, it is, the Green Deal has announced a, an to be an array of ambitious policies in all areas. Let's quickly go through them, uh, not one by one, but in groups, because the most important ones were uh, fundamental things were already started in late 2019 and in very early 2020. Uh, they were not the sectoral policies, which are very often in the, uh, in the, in the center of attention. The first one was the annual sustainable growth strategy. I will come back to, into it in a, in, in a moment and uh, in December 2019. And the second one was the Green Deal investment plan, including the Just Transition Fund. So here you see two policies, the one an understanding of how should our economy, how can we, how can we integrate the sustainability aspect better in a traditional growth policy and how do we provide the financing to make this transition a just transition. The um, annual sustainable growth strategy is something very interesting, which normally skips the attention of uh, non-policy makers or the people in, in, in the system. In the European semesters process, the commission is providing advice to the member states on shaping their economic policies. In the past, so before it was the La Fanda Lines Commission, the um, European semester was focused on financial market stability, on the stability of public finance, on the stability of the banking sector. So basically it reflected the reactions of the price of the financial crisis 2018 to Euro crisis 2000 and, uh, 2008 to 2012. The focus on now, this we cut later on. Wait a moment. It reflected the um, financial, the, the outcome of the financial crisis 2008 to 2012. There, the focus on uh, financial market stability, banking stability was, was clear. Since 2017 18, the uh, European semester included a social aspect. Now, the sh but it was still a growth agenda. Now, basically, it says annual sustainable growth strategy, and it builds around the word competitive sustainability. So we want to build primarily sustainability but, and be competitive in that respect. It has competitive sustainability, has four pillars, the environmental sustainability, the uh, economic aspect of product productivity and the social aspect of fairness. So you basically see the three pillars of sustainable development, plus the financial plus the financial markets and the market stabilities, which are the traditional focus of the European semester. Just to uh, reframe it again, this is the focus of the advice the European Commission gives for the formulation of economic policies in the member states. So you see here a radical shift from a rather market fi financial market focus to really ecological sustainability transition social aspects in it. As I said, this was the first, uh, these were the first two policy initiatives, which were really the fundamental ones to saying, hey, that is our mindset. This is our change, reflects our changing mindset of economic policies. And these are the financial instruments we put in place for the just transition. And then you saw basically since March 2020, a large number of uh, 
sectoral policies, starting with the climate law in early March, um, the hydrogen strategy being published in uh, in, in July, the environment, uh, the um, circular economy action plan, together with the industrial strategies, also in in, in mid March. You see them here for, uh, shown on the picture. And the amazing thing for me was we didn't accumulate, despite the working conditions uh, since March 2020, we didn't accumulate any delays in, in announcing these, uh, these policies and in shaping these policy, in these sectoral policy initiatives, which cover, for example, also farm to fork yeah, with, a, with an approach to say, we don't look at agricultural policy. We don't look at the, the agri-food industry. We look from the production of raw materials in, in the farming sector to the supply industries to how do people ch shift their consumption to a healthy diet. So we look along the whole value chain and we formulate a policy along a value chain. You have on these slides the keywords, the catchphrases. So you could look into these policies one by one and look what is relevant for, for you, what comes up. That is something very important for you. Uh, all, your, all you in your companies, you have uh, the possibility to be an active partner in the transition, to be in the front runner of a sustainability transition, to build your competitiveness um, or to choose to, to be more reactive, to be more reactive to uh, the initiatives, the legislative initiatives that come up. Everything what I had presented before for the Green Deal were framework policies, where the announcement of a legal action, uh, of a legislative action is, is made. Take, for example, the Circular Economy Action Plan. There is a right to repair proposed. This right to repair will be put into a, into a legislative text, which undergoes discussion of member states and parliament. It will take several years to that it that it has a direct effect on your company, but it will have an effect on your company. Um, so you can use what I have presented these policy initiatives basically as a as a foresight radar. You see what is what will come in what form it will come. That's part of the of the political negotiation uh, that that will happen uh, during the next uh, this year and during the following years. But for sure, it will come in one case, in, in one with one design or another. If you choose to go into the forefront and to be a front runner in this transition, um, there are financing programs in place where you basically can finance your innovation activities to implement these policies, to embrace these policies already at, a, at an early stage. One example of this is Horizon Europe for research and innovation activities. Another pr uh, program that is relevant if you are more in the financial sector is InvestEU, where you can basically, banking sector in Flanders can shape financial instruments with the InvestEU programs in line with these policy priorities of the uh, European Green Deal. For a for large projects, you have heard, and in, in response to the COVID crisis, uh, the uh, recovery and resilience fund has been put in place as really to say we need a we need a recovery from the uh, from the coronavirus from the economic effects it has, but we it shall not be formulated as a return to what has been in place before. It shall something to jump ahead in the transition to use these tremendous funds which are made available with 750 billion euro of which uh, 40, well, close to 40 percent for the green transition that fund is basically for larger projects in the regions um, that, that were most affected last but not least in the financing programs you see basically the announcement that the european investment bank shall change into a, the European Climate Bank or act as a European Climate Bank. So you can also see there that, finance, that the investment of the bank itself and also the financing environment uh, will change toward, towards embracing more of the sustainability transition aspects. So thank you for your attention. That was a quick introduction into the European Green Deal and what it could mean for companies but not yet more for the strategy of the companies, not for the day-to-day -day work and for the sales. I'm looking forward to the discussion later.
Hello, my name is Claire Dupont. I'm professor of European governance at Ghent University in Belgium. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to discuss a little bit the impact of the European Green Deal also in the international uh, context. Um, I'll be presenting very broad general lines. Um, my background is in political science, not really in international business, uh, but I hope that these broad general um, ideas will provide some feedback for anybody who's watching to really consider how the European Green Deal impacts their own organization and their, their future operations. So a number of key messages that I want to get up is that there, there is no longer any possibility to continue business as usual. Business as usual would mean climate catastrophe. So I want us to zoom out to think about why the European Green Deal is a necessary uh, policy instrument. And this is the, the basic underlying reason. And the other key message I'd like to take that everybody to take away is that transformation is inevitable. Whether that means that we are very good at implementing policy instruments such as the European Green Deal, then we are responding effectively to climate change, hopefully. And we have to transform all aspects of our society and economy, including international trade and global supply chains and value chains, to ensure that we are reducing our greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. That's an effective response to climate change. It would also require adaptation to the impacts of climate change that are anyway built into our atmosphere due to past emissions of greenhouse gases. If we do not succeed, transformation is anyway inevitable because the impacts that climate change will have across the globe on your businesses, on your investment cycles, on your supply chains, on just daily life will also be quite um, dramatic with the consequences unequally distributed. So if you can come away from this, this webinar today thinking, okay, business as usual is not an option, transformation is inevitable and think how will that affect your operations as a company, your operations even in, as an individual or at different levels of governance, then I think that's, that's a, a, the next exercise that needs to be engaged in and quite urgently. So I hope that will be the, the two main um, outcomes from today's discussion. And I want to say that the European Green Deal is a very important policy instrument, but it's not something that's there to impose restrictions on um, previous ways of working on business as usual just for the sake of it. In fact, it's about creating opportunities through this transformation. And the reason is that we have so much scientific knowledge now about how climate change is affecting us, about how climate change will affect us, about how we have through our business as usual over the last uh, number of years since the industrial revolution really damaged our climate system. So as of 2020, we know that we have increased the global average temperature by about 1.2 degrees Celsius. The Paris Agreement that was an international climate agreement adopted in 2015 outlines that the safe operating climate for human should human beings for humanity means that we should not increase global average temperature by more than two degrees and that even at two degrees we already see significant impacts including heightened desertification heat waves droughts all of these these um, impacts of climate change that we are already starting to see um, as also mentioned in the presentation by Sven earlier so we have the knowledge we ha about what is happening. We know what is causing it, it's the emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We know that we are in a position where we will anyway suffer the impacts of climate change because we have been continuing to emit greenhouse gases into the atmosphere for a long time. Um, and we know that if we want to reduce the damage as much as possible, we have to take drastic transformative action. And that's where the European Green Deal comes in. So I wanted to focus a bit on the international dimensions of the European Green Deal. And you'll have seen a lot more detail about the, the European Green Deal, its origins, and also the different policy instruments and framework policies um, from Sven's presentation just now. But I wanted to let you think a bit as well about what all of this means in an international context. And in fact, even though the European Green Deal itself has 
one specific aspect about the EU as a global leader as with a very external and internationally focused outlook. In fact, if you look at any of the aspects of the European Green Deal, they will have international effects. And those international effects can be um, in terms of uh, the global trade, in terms of investment flows, in terms of political relations, diplomatic relations between countries, in terms of development relations and partnerships, um, because the EU's economy, as it transforms, it will also have trickle effects to its partners outside of the EU. Whether or not there is a European Green Deal in place in places like Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, what the EU does internally has external effects. And I think that's something that you, we also need to be prepared for. It should not become, it should not come as a surprise if the EU's circular economy implemented inside the European Union has effects on trade relations with other countries and other business partners outside of the EU. So anybody who is who is working in a context, an international context, needs to be prepared for the transformation that is coming, whether or not there is a European Green Deal in place in the jurisdiction in which they're working. And that the motivation also, I think, for the transformation should not only come from the governance situation that the European Green Deal exists, but should also come from the scientific knowledge we have about how climate change is affecting all aspects of our lives and how if we want to continue to have uh, civilization on planet Earth, we do have to take drastic transformative action. The way I would think about it is that we are now entering a phase where we have finally understood, I think, in the policies, policy making sphere, not only in Europe, in many other parts of the world, too, that we need to see a different order, that we no longer see the economy at the top of the pyramid as the most important aspect of um, development that society comes second and that the environmental biosphere it comes third. In fact, you need to be able to see, and this picture shows it quite well, how they all are embedded within each other. That unless we have a healthy planet system, unless we have a healthy earth system and ecological and uh, climate and environmental system, society will not be able to function healthily and the economy will not be able to function healthily because we rely on these earth supporting systems for both a healthy and peaceful society and our economic well-being. So we need to see things differently. This doesn't change the fact that the economy and society are embedded within the environmental uh, system. But what it does do is it places the framework of the environment first. And that I think is a very important point to take also from Sven's uh, remarks earlier, that we're now moving from this understanding of the economic and market forces are what drive our development. Rather, we flip this on its head and say, no, it's preserving sustainability that is what drive it's, drives our, our, our choices in the future. Uh, and I think that's that's a very different way of thinking. And it's it's something that requires real deep reflection on all of your your own activities as an organization, as a governance actor, as a business to figure out if you are in line with this way of thinking, too. It, it's very transformative because it means it's a system that that gets rid of business as usual. It means business as usual can no longer continue. Just going a bit more into the international dimensions. So here I'm focusing on this idea as the EU, the EU as a global leader on climate action, also on climate policy. Now, you have to take this also in the consideration of international relations. The EU has long been an important actor when it comes to climate um, governance at the international level, but at the same time has been focusing itself also on economic development within its borders. So this is a transformation that will require time to implement. Um, and the more that multiple stakeholders, multiple actors, such as businesses and governance agencies, uh, government agencies can move forward knowing that this transformation is happening, then the more likely we are also to help the European Green Deal be well implemented, but also to succeed on our climate challenge. So the, the EU's European Green Deal has many aspects that are part of this international relations. Not all of them are explicit within the European Green Deal, 
but they are implicit and they are implied in how the EU's uh, climate policy and its European Green Deal will be implemented. So for example, the European Union as a global leader on climate action means that it needs to engage in, in green diplomacy, which it has been doing for several years, but now this is becoming more integrated with many of its other diplomatic actions, including uh, negotiations on trade. This will be something that probably needs to be revisited, how much of it can be uh, implemented and embedded into trade negotiations. Also investment flows. Um, Sven mentioned the European Investment Bank as the European Climate Bank. This is very important because the signals that the EU itself is no longer interested in investing in the old fossil economy, let's put it like that. We even see, I think this week it was, that ministers of foreign affairs from the member states have agreed to stop investing in coal. All of these are signals that things are changing and that you, as businesses, you need to be, I would suggest, even at the front line, be the front runners at the head of the game because the opportunities uh, are in the change, not in remaining um, in the old economy that we have today. Furthermore, there are some instruments that the European uh, Union is proposing under the European Green Deal that do have very direct external effects. And one would be the carbon border adjustment. This is still um, an instrument that's undergoing a lot of discussion. I would think, I, I would interpret it as a diploma, diplomas, diplomatic um, tool to try and encourage or even coerce other sectors, other countries to um, ensure that they are adopting similarly ambitious um, sustainability goals. So the carbon border adjustment would add um, extra tariffs for products coming into the European uh, economy in the European single market if they do not meet certain sustainability criteria. So put that down the line, then you would expect that um, products coming from Turkey or China um, would instead rather be produced in a way that they don't have to pay the tariff. This is a, a right now a very political discussion, but you can also prepare for such things by making sure that um, you know what's coming, and I would certainly urge you to follow the, the advice that Sven gave earlier and use the European Green Deal policy initiatives as your planning, uh, your foresight analysis, to ensure that you know what's coming in terms of the policy developments, but also because you understand and that you understand that if you don't, um, we will enter a situation of dramatic cl climate change. Further, there are some shifting um, aspects of international relations that still need to play out. For example, the relations with China, the relationship between the US and China, the relationship between the US and the EU on climate change. We know now that China, South Korea and Japan have put forward pledges to the Paris Agreement that they would also achieve um, uh, ambitious climate targets such as carbon neutrality by 2050 or by 2060 in the Chinese case. Um, and we now have initial and um, studies that show that if all the pledges that have now been submitted to the Europe, to the Paris Agreement are upheld, if they are implemented, we may achieve a global warming increase in global average temperatures of about 2.1 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. If you remember at the beginning, the Paris Agreement outlines that no more than two degrees um, is, is a safe. So the safe operating space for humanity is less than two degrees. The Paris Agreement also says that we should be as close to 1.5 degrees as warming, of warming as possible. So there's still some work that needs to be done with the pledges. We need to see now what the USA will really be able to implement under the Biden administration and whether the EU and the US together can encourage other actors to, to come on board with um, these, these newly um, engaged actors in parts of Asia. So these are still things that are playing out, but in any case, take the message, transformation is inevitable one way or the other. So we need to make sure we're prepared for that. Um, this was this is a, a diagram of what's called the donut economy. So this is a an idea of how we can function in terms of our, our safe 
and just operating space for humanity, where we have a basis of good social foundations and we have a ceiling within which we can operate. We cannot move beyond this, this ceiling of operation if we want to ensure that we are environmentally and ecologically sustainable. This is a proposal by the economist Kate Raworth. Um, I would certainly recommend that you, you engage in, in her work if you are serious about the transformation and, and want to understand what it means. There still is a lot of work that we have to do both on making sure there's a robust social foundation for humanity and society and to make sure we work within the environmental ceiling um, that, that is proposed in the, the donut economic, economic uh, um, framework. In some respects, the European Green Deal is an effort to move the European economic development to this safe and just operating space for humanity. At the same time, the European Union only has the competence to work on so many of these aspects. So a lot is still within the hands of national governments, within the hands of other stakeholders, within the hands of businesses to move forward on all of these aspects in harmony with the European Green Deal. But the European Green Deal sets an overarching framework that, that is, is affecting all aspects and all uh, aspects of society and economy and really has an integrated view of how to move towards sustainability without uh, uh, really breaking down too many of the, um, the, the pillars of society that we have developed in Europe over the years. So for those of you who want to engage in the exercise of preparing for and thinking about transformation and thinking of the contribution that your organization or business can make to the transformation to sustainability, I would recommend the framework by Kate Raworth as a good starting point. You can also go further because we know that in some respects we have already overshot the ceiling of environmental sustainability in many different sectors. And we know that some of the solutions we have, for example, climate change will have other environmental impacts Therefore, we still require innovation and thinking and uh, novel thinking on how to move forward and a lot of research. So just to conclude, what I hope you got from this presentation is some reflections about how this will affect your operations, um, your organization and your businesses. Because business as usual would re means climate catastrophe. Business as usual is no longer an option. Transformation is inevitable. The success, scale and scope of the transformation depends on the implementation, also the speed of implementation and the action of multiple stakeholders. The EU and the European Commission cannot implement this themselves. Um, and of course, there are always going to be uh, stakeholders who will be a bit behind, but there can also be stakeholders who are running ahead and can show the way for others. So it, it's a choice I think that every, every organization needs to make. The key operating principle of any organization should be achieving sustainability across all operations, all policies, all decisions, all international relations, your entire supply chain, your value chain. Uh, integration is the key. And I think this is about turning everything on its head. No longer is the objective economic growth, economic development, profit. Um, this is not our objective anymore because this has led us to the situation where we are in now, which is on the cusp of climate catastrophe. So shift it all on its head and think, well, now we're in a mode where we need to think about sustainability. And it's a, a, it's a moral responsibility of all of those of us who have, have positions where we can take decisions that, that have such effects that we make sure that those decisions put sustainability first. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I would very much uh, appreciate any feedback or comments you may have or questions. Hello, I'm uh, Pascal Verheyen. I'm uh, NCP uh, for the Green Deal in Flanders. I'm also NCP for some other areas like uh, transport, uh, innovation fund and security. I will give you a brief explanation of how we can actually help you in uh, drawing up a proposal for the different uh, research and innovation programs of the European Union. So the first program started back in 1984. We're now at the eighth programming period, which will start in the spring of this year. 
and uh, the Horizon 2020 program has just ended. Uh, so we can have a short look at uh, the results of that one. About 10 to 15% of all proposals were funded, so that's very low. And the reason is very simple because there's a high funding rate of 70 to 100%. Um, so that means there's also a very high demand for this uh, kind of program, uh, more than in, uh, other similar uh, European programs. If you want to have a, a good overview of all the projects that have been funded in the past, you can have a look at uh, the quarters websites. I'll uh, put a link on this slide. So the Green Deal in uh, Horizon 2020 finished uh, on the 27th of January. Uh, I will not go too much into detail. These topics will, will also be included in future uh, programs, uh, such as the Horizon Europe program. And the main objective of the Green Deal, that is to create uh, a more uh, fair and sustainable society through innovation, will remain in place in uh, many of the future calls. So how does Horizon Europe look like? Um, and what calls are interesting for uh, companies? So the first area of interest is pillar two, the global challenges and the European industrial competitiveness. Um, many companies are active in that area, but mainly bigger ones or mid caps. And the reason is very simple uh, because you need uh, about four to five years from the early preparation of the project all the way to the end of the project. And for many smaller companies, that's a bit too long. In pillar three, we have the European Innovation Council, which is really focusing at SMEs. Uh, this is for SMEs who really want to uh, make the transition from the market, uh, from the innovation all the way to the market, and for this to get a subsidy to scale up their efforts and um, reach and commercialize their products. So, where can you actually find all these calls? Um, you can find them on the funding and tender portal. So I've uh, put the link here. You just insert your topic, get all the details of the call. And at the bottom of the page, there's also um, an overview of other partners in Europe that want to submit a proposal for the, the same um, call. Um, for most calls for proposals within Horizon Europe, you will need several partners. It might be uh, 10, sometimes 15, or over, even over 20. So you cannot do this on your own. So a good consortium is probably the most essential part of each uh, project proposal. So I've put here a couple of links uh, with more web, more information on um, Horizon Europe and also uh, of the view of the European Commission on Horizon Europe. Um, so what do we offer as uh, services? So we're the national contact point uh, team for uh, Horizon Europe. So we give information on Horizon Europe, just general information also on the Green Deal and the Innovation Fund, which uh, is looking at companies who want to reduce their CO2 emission. We also help with uh, searching partners for your project. We answer legal and financial questions on the calls which are open. And we often uh, organize trainings and workshops on how to write a proposal. Uh, because especially if you're a new uh, newcomer in this area, it can be quite hard to uh, write a good proposal. And then we also collaborate on some matchmaking events which are related to the partner search. So if you want to stay informed, you can actually register on our new website and you can also uh, indicate in which areas of Horizon Europe you are interested. Then very short, I will talk a bit about our uh, other partner, Enterprise Europe Network Founders. Whereas we are focusing more on research and innovation, Enterprise Europe Network is focusing more on successful business and how to expand internationally within Europe. Uh, to this, uh, for this purpose, they are also organizing brokerage events, uh, also for um, companies who are looking for uh, partners for um, European projects. So I've added here the contact points per province. And finally, also several NCPs are also involved in the EEN. So there's a kind of synergy between the NCP team and the EN team. Uh, so we get like a, a good collaboration. 
So yeah, these are my contact details. So if you have more questions on our services, you don't hesitate to contact me uh, by email or phone or uh, 